So I'm here today with Aaron Bronstetter, great MMA reporter and journalist who's interviewed some of the best in the world. Aaron, first off, first question I wanted to start with actually is something completely unrelated to MMA, different sport. You're into football. You're a big fan of the NFL. You said previously that you don't have a specific team that you follow or enjoy. Does that still hold true today? Yeah, it does. Um, You know, football is such a, first off, I live in Toronto. We don't have a football team here, yeah. but football is such like a revolving door of, you know, players, right? So what I tend to do is I, I like watching certain players do their thing. So like, let's say I'm a fan of Jalen Hurts and the way that he plays quarterback. Like if he is great and like he's put, putting up great numbers, but then suddenly he gets like traded to the Broncos or something. Am I like not going to be, you know, why would I continue to be an Eagles fan if they're rebuilding? Right. Yeah. The way that I look at it is people put so much investment into liking certain teams that are going to just like disappoint them like 95, 90, anywhere between 95 to 99% of the time. Trust me, I'm so a Giants like, fan. Well, I've been dealing with it. <laughs> well, you've also got some Super Bowls though. So you're doing yeah. okay. At least you're not a Jets fan. But uh, yeah, so that's the kind of thing that um, I, I don't know. I don't really want to get invested in a particular team. The only team that I, in my like basically my whole life in terms of professional team that I feel like I've had a real investment in is the Toronto Raptors because they had their expansion year when I was alive, right? Like, you know, yeah. I was, I was like in my formative years and we had this new team in town. So and it was the first basketball team in Canada, along with the Vancouver Grizzlies, which are gone now. So I, I feel like a little bit more invested in them than any other team, but even them, like I couldn't tell you what their record is right now. I, I'm not, I'm a, I'm a very fair weather fan at this point. Yep. I, I'm the same way with basketball at this point. It's hard to keep up with all those games and everything. It's just, it's hard. Um, I know you were actually into basketball. You wanted to do interviewing and reporting for basketball in the first place. Tell me a little bit about that. What made you change into MMA and what piqued your interest into MMA journalism and reporting in the first place? Yeah, so I always wanted to be a broadcaster or reporter or, or work in media in, in some capacity. And like you mentioned, basketball was like the thing I was so passionate about when I was university age and, and beyond uh, when I entered into sports media. So I really focused on that. But then um, I, I was working with a radio host. I was a producer at the time who was really into mixed martial arts. And I started watching it, just instantly fell in love with the sport and uh, became so invested in it and, and was so, um, you know, I, I would watch dream events from Japan. Like I'd PVR them and watch anything them the next you time. can. Yep. Yeah. Anything I could to just like soak in as much knowledge of it as possible. Went back and watched all the old events from before I started watching, you know, like, I I, uh, I just fell in love with the sport and it just organically became something that I ended up doing as my career because I was more knowledgeable about it than than all of my other co-workers. Yeah, I feel the same way. That's kind of why I got into MMA in the first place, too, is I just it just piqued my interest just in general, just the fighting, the martial arts aspect and all of that. And then. I don't know, just the more I got into it, the more I realized I just knew so much. And that I that's why I've been like trying to break news and things like that. I just feel like I'm so on top of things when it comes to that compared to so many just other people I see. And it's just, I don't know. I just thought I definitely should give it a shot. I really enjoy this. So, yeah, well, I mean, yeah. you got to start somewhere, right? <laughs> exactly. You said you had a guinea pig when you were young. Do you still have a love for pets? I don't know where I said that, where you found that in my interview. But yes, we did have a guinea pig. We had it for a very short period of time. Because I think the majority of my family were allergic to it. But uh, I have a dog. I have a 14-year-old dog um, that I've had since she was a puppy. So uh, I, in terms of animals, like I'm a dog lover. You know, if I could, if I could uh, just have a dog for the rest of my life, you know, and that would be the, the pet that I had. That's like the only pet that I have any interest in having. Yeah, I have a dog too, but I also have I have an array of animals. I have a dog, lizard, <laughs> hamster, hermit crab. I have all of them. But that's why I asked about the guinea, guinea pig because I have a hamster too. So big, uh, big pet lover over here. Mm. You, uh, what's it? You always originally like wanted to work on basketball, right? But when you went into MMA, what was some like difficulties that you found transitioning? Cause obviously you were working on a completely different sport. There's going to be difficulties, even when you're used to the sport, what were things you had to adjust to going from basketball to MMA? Cause two completely. I wasn't, I wasn't working on basketball, so to speak. Okay. Like I was working for a, a big sports network. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. And I was just following along with MMA. This is my first reporting job I've ever had. Yeah. So um, in terms of an adjustment, I mean, the adjustment was just learning on the job, right. Learning how yeah. to be a, a good reporter, making sure that I uh, maintain journalistic integrity and, and uh, do things the right way. 
Um, so that was really the only, I mean, basically I transitioned to a brand new job. It wasn't even like just transitioning sports. It was like an entire career transition yeah. um, cool. from one, I guess, being more behind the scenes in sports media to being front facing. So that was a big adjustment in and of itself. Yeah. So like you said, you were behind the scenes and you were a producer. Tell, talk to me about the MMA show that was on the score. I know you were a producer on there for about five years. Tell me about some of your favorite episodes, some of your favorite moments. I don't know, just a little bit about the show. Yeah, I actually only produced that for several, for a couple of months, but I worked at the uh, the score radio station for about five years. Okay. Um, and then at the end of my uh, tenure there, before I got hired on by TSN, I was producing two shows. One was called the Tim and Sid Uncut, which was a, a very big podcast at the time. And then um, also the MMA show with Mauro Ronaldo. Yeah. So, you know, I don't have a ton of memories of, of anything that stands out to me because I wasn't doing it for that long, right? So um, I just loved working with Mauro Ronaldo. Mauro Ronaldo was a, a real, really interesting guy to work with. He's uh, so passionate. He's mm-hmm. so good at what he does. So getting to watch him do his thing day in and day out really was the, the biggest takeaway for me from that job. Yeah, he seems like a, such a vibrant personality. I just re- really wanted to know how it was like working with someone like him. So your first UFC event, UFC 206, tell me how was the experience? What did you do? Anything catch you by surprise that maybe you didn't expect necessarily? Just the event. I know it was Holloway versus Pettis, right? Yeah, that was uh, UFC 206. And that was the first event uh, I did get to cover. And what an event it was. That was, I think, the consensus event of the year in terms of the actual action that took place on that card. It was an awesome card. Um, But yeah, it was really my first time conducting interviews backstage and um, I don't even, I can't even remember if I did conduct interviews at that event. I think I did. I was working backstage with Robin Black. The event was in my backyard in Toronto. So it, that made it a little bit easier. Um, and then in the, the new year, that's when I started traveling because this was a December event. That's when I started to travel to events and be on my own and, and learn on the fly. So I don't really have, I mean, one thing that stands out to me was, um, we were in an area backstage where you could see all the fighters come out after their fights and Tim Kennedy lost to Kelvin Gastelum on that card. Okay. And to this day, I've never seen somebody beaten up so badly backstage where like he was like head to toe bruises. And that was really, you know, kind of a welcome to the league moment for me. It was just like seeing that and seeing just how damaging the sport can be firsthand. Uh, That really, if you were to ask me what the most uh, memorable thing from that first card was, the thing that I remember the most, it would be that. Okay. Anything surprising? Not to mention also watching Duho Choi and Ra- and Cub Swanson yeah, I mean, uh, backstage was awesome. Did you uh, anything um, surprise you necessarily at all, specifically, or no? Just uh, I, I, everything I probably I just I can't remember I it that remember much, right? Like no, we're talking funny. six years ago, and I just I, I there are I'm sure there's like if you mention any card that I've covered on location, I could probably remember one standout thing from it. But like I, in terms of what surprised me. Yeah, I mean the whole situation was very different to me, but I'm I'm really I don't get nervous about a lot of things. So even though it was a new experience for me, I felt like I could just jump right in, and uh, I, I feel like I did a good job, you know, considering it was my first time doing it, and I was really thrust into the big show. So um, I don't really, but yeah, in terms of an individual takeaway, I don't really have one for you. Got it. No, that's fine. You say, you said that, you, you know, you really don't get nervous and that you usually stay calm. Have you ever been intimidated or anything during an interview, whether it was due to fame, aggression, or just a random nervousness that occurred during that interview? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we're talking about some of the, the best fighters in the world, not to mention that before I started covering the sport, I was a fan, right? So when you watch through the eyes of a fan through that lens versus through the lens of somebody who's covering the sport, it's very different. So getting to meet Anderson Silva and interview John Jones, um, interview Dana White, like those kind of things early in my career were very nerve wracking because I had to kind of remember that I'm there to do a job um, and disassociate from my former self, so to speak, yeah. the, the the fan that used to watch the events and, and was really invested in how people did and, and all of that. Like I had to put that aside and, just focus on the task at hand. And I found that one good distraction from me when I first started doing this was like, I was would always worry about my attire, about looking really professional, about looking good on camera. And I found that focusing on that took a lot of the nerves away from the interview itself. Okay. Um, so that was the thing that I tried to really focus on uh, from that standpoint, because it was more within my control. And I think that helped me a lot. That's what I was about to say. It's something you could control, something you knew was going to be in your reach no matter what. 
yeah, exactly. So that was uh, the way that I kind of transitioned into this job without being too worried about the interview itself. I, I focused more on the things like, like I just said that I, that I can control a little bit more. And that way um, I, I was able to worry about that instead of placing my worries on other things that were outside of my control. No, it makes a lot more sense. So how does it feel knowing you've interviewed some of the best and most sought after fighters in the world, the John Jones, the Anderson Silva's, the Conor McGregor's, you know, you've interviewed them all. I mean, how does it feel knowing that you get the best of the best? Well, it feels great to have this job, right? Like, I don't really reflect on those individual instances. Like at the time it's happening, except for like really early in my career, it just feels like another interview. Um, so I, I don't, you know, I, I would love to have the time to take a step back and be like, wow, look at all this stuff that I've accomplished during this time doing this job. I just haven't had that time yet because the sport is so like, it's a year round sport. I, I barely get any downtime during the year. This is a good week for me because there's no um, event this weekend. So it's actually the first time I can sit down and kind of charter out my goals for the year and, uh, and, and take a step back from the job itself and focus on what I can do going forward. So this is one of the more valuable weeks of the year for me for that reason. Definitely. I mean, I was making a joke to my friends. I was like, I've been covering the sport for less than a month now. I started my page right after the new year. And I was like, this week has been a great break because after the pay-per-view, after all these fights announced, after everything, like it's like my hands hurt with how much I have to type with how much news I have to post. I can only imagine how you having to be, in your position, how much you have to do with breaking some of this news and just all that. I definitely need some well, well rested breaks in the middle. So the, a week like this is definitely great. But then even in a week like this, you have Kelvin Gastelum, Chris Curtis, Romanov and Volkov getting announced. You have big fights getting announced regardless. There's still things you always have to cover. You can never really get a break with this sport. Yeah, you can try. But yeah. a lot of the time that's futile. Yeah, seriously. Um, you're very knowledgeable when it comes to judging and you you've gone to judging seminars. You've talked to Sean Sheehan, some of the best out there in terms of their opinions on judging, how to judge, how to score fights. What would your solution be to scoring in the UFC and bad judging in general? Well, I don't think there is a whole lot of bad judging. I think that's something of a mis misnomer. Okay. What I would focus on is educating people about the criteria, because I think a lot of people don't really watch fights through that lens um, and that's why they disagree with the judges a lot. Like the judges are looking at the fight through the lens of, of a written page of information, which is the scoring criteria. Like they, they're not focused on like, oh, who's winning the fight? Who's got more control? Like they, they, they have a very specific set of guidelines that they have to follow in order to assess who is winning a specific round. And I think that the more that people understand how fights are judged, the less people will cry robbery. Now, a couple of solutions that I've come up with for this, and I don't know if they'll ever happen, but I would love to see the UFC hire a, a current judge that transitions to becoming a broadcaster or a former judge that doesn't do as many events. And on a weekly basis, have them break down all of the different rounds that were contestable or that people didn't, where either the judges didn't agree or people thought that it was a bad scorecard and explain through the lens of the criteria why a judge could have seen it that way. Um, and just, just put like, whether it's a 10 minute segment or something like that, put that on YouTube, put that on fight pass and just give people an opportunity to, to learn more about the scoring criteria in a more digestible way, rather than reading a sheet of paper. If you can see actual examples of the scoring criteria being applied, I think that will give people a much better understanding of what they're watching through that lens. And the other thing that I would love to see is half point, like a half point system. I think that would be more conducive uh, to MMA than a, a 10 point must system. I'd like to see 10 to nine and a half, 10 to nine, 10 to eight and I, a half, 10 to eight. I saw you say somewhere on Twitter that you said a decimal system, something like, yeah. something like verdict. It's maybe? a half point. Like, decimal what? system is inaccurate. Like I, okay. I, I'm sure I wrote that, but yes. it's more a half point system. I don't want to okay. see like 9.2. Yeah. Got it. So yeah, you want to see like, yeah, got it. I get, I get where you, I get where you're coming from. It makes sense though, because I don't know. I just feel like the way judging is now, not the not that the criteria is messed up, but there's some something needs to change. There's obvious there's obvious problems going on with judging and just all controversy with all of that. So I want to ask you a question: Who won the second round of Figueredo and Moreno at two eighty three? See, through the lens I was watching, I thought it was Moreno 
I but, did too. Okay. Yeah. But at the same time, I was watching with Charles Jordan in an office. I wasn't as focused on it as I normally would be. Um, I, I do have to go back and watch it and see what all of those other judges saw because maybe during the fight, like if I'm watching with someone else, and it's rare that I am, um, in that instance, I was watching with Charles. But if I'm watching by myself, I can really zone in on what's going on during a round and give a scorecard that I'm really, you know, I really feel I can stand behind. Any scorecard from this past weekend's event, because I was watching with someone else, I feel like I can't give a really objective um, answer to any sort of scorecards from an event where I'm, again, kind of distracted. And same goes for when I'm on location and I'm backstage um, at an event. Like, I, I can't give my entire focus to some rounds on that night. Do you um so I noticed that you obviously like tweet your scorecards out. They show them on the broadcast sometimes and all of that. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes you'll score like a 10-9 for the first round and then you'll skip the second round, but then you'll tweet out the third round. Is it because you didn't watch enough of that round and you're not comfortable tweeting out your score for that round not knowing? Or how do you feel about that? Like what's that situation? Yeah, typically I think that if I'm if there's a round where I I don't put it out there something's distracted me or, you know, sometimes, you know, one of my kids will yell something downstairs, right? Like any, anything that uh, distracts me from uh, putting in a, a scorecard that I'm happy to, that I'm willing to stand behind. Usually I won't submit one. Okay. Yeah. Makes a hundred percent sense. You kind of walked me into this a little bit before, but uh, how was watching the fights with Charles Jordan in 283? Like you said, you don't really watch the fights with other people. You said there's a select few who, you know, you, you will watch the fights with, but normally it's just you by yourself. How was the experience? Oh, it's great. I mean, anytime you can watch a fights with with a UFC athlete and they can kind of show you things that you might not see through through the way that you're watching it, like that's just extremely valuable. And just getting to spend time with Charles, he's just a great, great guy all around, like super nice guy, always has a smile on his face, super enthusiastic. Um, so you know, I it was it was great. It was a nice change of pace for me. Good. Good. I actually watched him fight in um, Long Island. I watched him fight Shane yeah. Burgos. That was an amazing fight. I um, The crowd was so, so hyped for that one. Uh, so I wanted to ask some opinions on the fights this past weekend. Uh, Glover Jamal, Figueredo Moreno, just break it down. UFC 283 in, in your eyes. Tell me how you felt about the card. I thought it was a great card. I thought that from top to bottom, there were a lot of exciting fights. Um, I didn't think that the main or co-main would go the way that they did. Uh, I thought I thought it was going to be different, but uh, that's why I love the sport. It's always going to surprise you. Um, but from a standpoint of somebody who was in Brazil watching, I feel like that would have been a pretty sad card to be a part of. I mean, yeah. there were some high highs like Jose Aldo getting into the Hall of Fame, Gilbert Burns with his you know beautiful win over Neil Magny, but and Je Jessica Andrade dominating Lauren Murphy, but also some really low lows like uh, Figueiredo losing, um, Glover losing, and, and subsequently retiring. Um, Shogun Hua having, you know, retiring on, on, you know, not, not making a very good, you know, good account of himself. Yeah. So I think it was a mixed bag for the fans that were in Brazil. I mean, yeah, that's kind of why they left early, right? That's probably, I mean, it was also 3 15 a.m. To, yeah. To that, yeah. No, a lot of people are talking about that. I felt that really thing. sad though. Watching Glover give his farewell empty speech arena. to an empty arena had a bad feel to it, but no, it's horrible. Listen, I get it. 3.15 a.m. Probably want to get home. How classy of Glover, though. I mean, he saw what happened in the co-main event, and he was like, Jamal's walking out with me. Like, I want you guys to treat him with respect. Like, when he said that, it was just like, what a way to go out. You know what I mean? You're retiring. You may just like, everything's about you in this moment. You, you retired. Like, yeah, Jamal beat you in the fight. He won the title. But it was his moment in Brazil, retirement. And he got there on the mic and was like, hey, like, respect this guy. Like, don't do, like, don't pull anything on him. Like, that was really cool. Just shows the kind of guy that Glover is. Yeah, that's Glover in a nutshell. Yeah. Like, can you think okay. of any real rivalry that Glover's had with anybody that has extended beyond the the walls of the octagon? Like, no. he's just a, a good dude, and I think that everybody respects him for that. And uh, well, who was it? Uh, it was Chuck. Chuck that brought Glover in originally, right? Yeah. That he was all, "Hey, you got to sign this guy," and it took a while for Glover to actually get into the UFC. And when he finally did, he was a wrecking ball. But yeah, well, it they, took a while for him to get a visa. That was the problem. He couldn't that's get what it into was. the US. Yeah. Um, what about the Bond theme, bros? How did they, I mean, that was, both of them looked ridiculous. Just tell me a little bit about your thoughts on them. Yeah. I mean, I think that they, uh, they certainly delivered on the promise that they had from the contender series, probably over delivered if anything. Oh yeah. Um, I mean, that Ismail Bond theme fight, the way that he was wrestling with McKinney to make him tired and make him think a lot, um, kind of overwhelmed his CPU. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. Uh, the guy is very, very advanced. And I thought that Gabriel Bonfim against 
um, Munir Lazez just made it look like easy work. Um, I, I thought that both guys had a great account of themselves. Yeah, Fight yeah they really did. I was uh, what's I was greatly impressed. I uh, I probably would have thought that both of them would have won going in, but just the the manner, the dominance that they both showed against two very good opponents, especially Ismail. I mean, those those boys are coming for blood. They're coming for blood. They're they're good. Uh, let me ask you some opinions on some upcoming fights. Um, Islam versus Volkanovsky. How are we feeling about that? Uh, I mean, I think Volk is in tough for that fight. I think everybody believes that. But at the same time, we haven't really seen Volk get challenged much in the UFC. I mean, we saw the first Holloway fight was very close. but uh, And we saw Ortega get that choke on him. But, yeah, I mean, it's hard. I can't write Volkanovsky off. Like, I can't say... Volkanovski is definitely going to lose this fight. If I had to make a pick, I'd probably take Makhachev. But this is the first time we've seen the number one pound for pound fighter and the number two pound for pound fighter face one another. Mm-hmm. It's a really, really big event in terms of like the highest level of competition that you can get Amazing. in this sport. It's, it's unbelievable. Amazing. And I feel yeah, like it's not even getting that much fanfare. I think the closest time we got to this, because I looked, I checked, I think the closest we ever got to this was DC and Stipe. The first time they fought, I think they were one in three, one in four pound for pound, something like that. But they yeah. were right at the top right there. But we've never had anything like this. This is an unbelievable. GSP versus time. Penn, I think, is probably the closest comparison. Oh, yeah. Pound for pound rankings at the time. Those guys were both like at the, the top yeah. of their game. At there that weren't time. even, there weren't rankings at that time, were there? Maybe. No, they no, just, rankings. Yeah, no, 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 rankings. no rankings at all. Yeah. yeah. Um, But that was probably the closest that we've seen to like a, a one versus one two versus pound three. for pound, or at least close. Uh, This one, I think, is going to be special. It's going to be a great fight. How are we feeling about Usman Lee on three, the trilogy? Well, it's, it's interesting to me because Usman won pretty much that whole fight last time until he lost, right? But at the same time, what does losing do to him mentally? Well, you know, And then Leon in the back of his head has to know that he had a, a rough night until, again, he won that fight. And that's what makes it so interesting is like, what is going to be the, um, you know, wh- which version of those guys is going to show up? Not to mention Usman's another year older. I think he's probably he's either going to be 35 or going to be 36 sometime soon. So he's getting into the later st- stage of his career. I'm really intrigued by it. If I had to make a pick, I think Usman is going to be able to to beat him, though. I think I think he's a, probably a pretty sizable favorite, if I had to guess. I don't have the odds in front of me. Probably minus 250 or something like that. But uh, I think that's probably about where it should be. Okay. And then Marab versus Yan. How do you think that one goes? That one's pretty pretty big fight for that division. Yeah, that's an awesome fight. Um, and I like the fact that it's five rounds, too. I think that both those guys are going to be able to let it, you know, to breathe a little bit. I mean, it's basically going to come down to whether or not Marab can get takedowns. If Marab gets takedowns, I think he can hold Piotr Jan down or at least make his life miserable for a round or two. But Piotr Jan is so good. I know. And um, even though he's on that losing streak right now, I expect him to bounce back in that one. But uh, I guess we'll see. I just think that on the feet, he's going to have a massive advantage. Okay. Final thoughts on the Francis situation now that everything's kind of died down a little bit more with it, you know, no, a little bit less talk about it and just the world in general. So, you know, PFL, BKFC, boxing, you know, what do you, what do you see Francis doing? You personally? I mean, we're talking, this was like just over a week ago that this happened. I feel like nobody's talking about it now. Like it's, it's done. It's crazy how quickly MMA just moves on. Oh but, yeah. If I were to guess, like I heard Steven Espinoza say that uh, they could offer him a deal to sign with Bellator and then also do boxing on Showtime, potentially against Deontay Wilder. I think that's the best case scenario for Francis. Because then he can keep doing MMA. He can be the, the make a lot of money doing both MMA and boxing under a big umbrella. Um, I mean, but when you look at Bellator's heavyweight division, like you, you could probably line up the top five in that division against Francis and he beat them in one night. And that's kind of the problem with with the situation is that Francis is going to be so much. Better. Yeah, no, I mean, that Bellator heavyweight division is rough. What, what is the top five? I want to say three of them are ex UFC heavyweights. It's Bader, 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 Phil Bader. Davis. Phil and... Davis isn't heavyweight. Oh, um, no, yeah, okay. So it's, it's like, I think it's Bader, it's Bader, it's Fedor, it's uh, what's Fedor's protege, protege's name? Um, I can't remember the dude. Oh, name. Alexander, uh, something, right? Or no. I'm thinking of someone yeah. else. Oh, Moldovsky, Valentin Moldovsky. Valentin Moldovsky, um, okay. Yeah. Um, who else is in that top five? Um, I, Linton Vassell is in that top five now. Um, he's actually facing Moldovsky next. So it's like those those are the top four, I, I believe, 
Um, and there's probably another name in there that I'm just forgetting uh, off the top of my head. Like Czech Congo might be in that mix. Honestly. That, that's who I was thinking of. Um, that's what, yep. Yeah. So, I mean, which of those guys does, does like Francis not like, again, I think you could line him up in one night for Francis. Exactly. Exactly. It's not really an appealing fight to anyone. Yeah. But um, what would you say to someone like me in looking to be in your position, looking to follow a career in MMA journalism, any tips, advice, just anything you'd say? Well, it seems like you're going about it the right way, which is you just do, you know, you, you don't wait for somebody to hire you. You don't uh, sit around and think, oh, what can I do? Just go, go out and do it. Pretend, that, I mean, just act like it's your job, like act like it's your job to cover mixed martial arts. And the beauty of it is in this day and age, equipment is so inexpensive that like you can buy a tripod and camera. You can go to regional MMA events and interview people. It's like it, the world is really the oyster of a, of a young journalist because you can, you can cover it. In, in so many different ways like the idea of like a straight up journalist in this day and age is starting to die it's becoming a dying art form because everybody's kind of becoming a content creator they're doing tiktok and they're doing instagram and they're doing all of these other social media aspects to the job that it gives a lot of opportunities to younger people that cover the sport to um find new and interesting ways to do it yeah yeah that's that's what i'm trying to do just like you said I, you said this somewhere be unique find your thing and just stick to it keep going and be consistent like that's what you have to do is just be consistent and be unique those are the two main things but um all right that that'll wrap up the interview i appreciate everything and i uh hope you have a great day i will talk to you